Western philosophy originated in ancient Greece, but it was a part of the Greek world, which actually wasn't in what is now the country of Greece. Rather, it was situated across the Mediterranean Sea on the coast of what is now the Asian portion of Turkey. There were Greek settlements there lining the coast of Asia Minor in a part of the Greek world that was known then as Ionia. And the first philosophers were Ionian. And in fact, a friend of mine, the uh, historian of science, Jerry Holton, refers to the intuitions of these first philosophers as the Ionian enchantment. The Greek world was then organized into many independent city-states, polis. Each polis had its own form of government. Some were monarchies, some were oligarchies, and the very important city-state of Athens was a democracy. These city-states, besides being politically dissimilar, each had their own army, and often these Greek armies were at war with one another. What unified the Greeks was a common language and culture, a religion and literature, most notably the great Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which contributed a certain shared outlook concerning the nature of reality, the nature of human life, and what it is to live a life worth living. That is, there was a general philosophy in that wide popular sense of the word that was shared by the Greeks before they even emerged the discipline of philosophy. The first Greek philosophers make their appearance in the sixth century BCE. And this is important and extremely interesting because the emergence of the discipline of philosophy in the Greek world wasn't an isolated event. The sixth century BCE was the apex of a period of great intellectual ferment that scholars have come to call the Axial Age. And in a truly dramatic way, the Axial Age, which lasted from roughly 800 to 200 BCE, continues to exert its influence on all of us, including you. It was the period when not only Greek philosophy arose, but the origins of all the world's religions. Buddhism and Jainism and Hinduism first emerged in India during this period. Zoroastrianism in Persia, Confucianism and Taoism in China, and the Abrahamic religion emerged in Palestine. Eventually, the Abrahamic religion evolved into three separate Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam that happened after the Axial Age. It was the 20th century philosopher Karl Jaspers who first noticed this interesting historical fact and who dubbed the period the Axial Age because of the way in which all existing orientations, yours, mine, all of ours, radiate out from that period. Whatever your most fundamental orienting outlook, whether you are oriented yourself from within one of the religious frameworks, or whether in contrast you have a naturalist point of view rejecting supernatural beliefs, then your orientation can be traced back to the orientation of the Greek philosophers. In fact, to the very first Greek philosophers, those Ionian philosophers. The locales that participated in the Axial Age all were in fairly established societies, withstanding armies, monetary systems, social hierarchies, including at the lowest end, slaves. They were all slave societies, including ancient Greece. Recent research has established that the participating societies, whether in Greece or Palestine or India, China or Persia, all had the highest caloric intake of their time, demonstrating a point that the playwright Bertolt Brecht had expressed quite succinctly, grub first, 
than ethics. In general, we can say that as soon as a certain level of stability and security and full stomach is attained, then people's natural reflective capacity can emerge. When you're struggling 24-7 simply to survive, to have your loved ones survive, you don't have the privilege of pondering what does it all mean. Why did the ancient Greek philosophers approach these what does it all mean questions by creating a new discipline, a new way of thinking out one's orientation, namely philosophy? a discipline that avoided the traditional answers of their culture and instead subjected all claims, including the claims of their culture, to strict standards of reason. I mean, after all, the ancient Greeks had a fairly elaborate religion involving a charmingly inventive mythology of the gods and goddesses of Mount Olympus. Greek society was saturated with religious rituals meant to appease the Olympian immortals who weren't particularly reliable in their attitudes toward us mortals and could turn quite vindictive even toward their favorites. The Homeric system, which featured not only the immortals of Mount Olympus, but also mortal heroes, Achilles, Achilles, Odysseus, Perseus, etc inspired what I've called an ethos of the extraordinary, where the answer to that third question, the normative question, how should we live, what goals ought we to pursue, was to strive to be extraordinary so that your deeds and so your name will live on even after you're gone. What one wanted in this Homeric ethos, which preceded philosophy, was what was called kleos, which is the Greek word for fame or glory. It means to have one's name on everybody's lips. This was the way to matter in the Homeric worldview. In fact, you can say that they had the first celebrity culture. They got their way before we did. What it was to live a worthy life was to be, uh, to be known. I mean, their social media were the poets. And so what you wanted was to inspire a poem that would sing your praises and spread your name. Their greatest uh, lyrical poet, Pindar, used to create poems for, for all of the heroes, including the athletes who won the major athletic events, including the Olympics. And, and he not only sung their praises, but he also sung about how important it is to be famous, that this is the way to answer the question, how ought we to live? Live so that others uh, will know you. Tinder was kind of the Kanye West of ancient Greece. This is in marked contrast to the religion that was slowly being developed across the Mediterranean among the Hebrews. In the Homeric worldview, the point of life wasn't to win the attention and approval of supernatural beings, as it is in the Hebrew religion. In Greek mythology, something pretty nasty usually happened if you got too much attention from the gods. And you just have to walk through a museum and look at the art that's been inspired by the ancient Greek mythology, the rape of Europa, the daughters of Lucipus, paintings, great paintings by the likes of Titian and Rubens. And they show what happened to the mortals that attracted too much attention from the gods. What you really wanted was attention from your fellow mortals. So even within the Homeric ethos, there was despite all the gods and goddesses, kind of incipient naturalism. When you came to think about this third orienting question, it was what you could do in human terms, winning the approbation of your fellow mortals, that was at the core of the Homeric answer to the question of what makes for a worthy and estimable human life. To the last of these three orienting questions, the Greek worldview was answered in human terms. And perhaps, just a hypothesis, that helps to explain why the discipline of philosophy, with its reliance on strictly human capabilities, 
natural reason and probing our intuitions, why it arose there in Greece. No in transcultural beliefs, including religious beliefs, no revered texts, including the Homeric texts, could be accepted without subjecting them to rational scrutiny. Socrates, the Athenian philosopher whom we'll be considering in a later chapter, famously said in defense of philosophy, and in fact, as we'll see, in defense of himself when he was on trial for his life, that the unexamined life is not worth living, which is probably the most famous motto in the history of philosophy. This soundbite captures, as well as any soundbite can, the orientation that defines the discipline of philosophy. The whole axial age brings up the question of what is the difference between religion and philosophy, since both were responses to the orienting questions that rose to the fore during the axial age. The various religious traditions are defined by the particular answers they give to the three orienting questions. So for example, in the Abrahamic religion, the question of where are we is answered by the story of creation, with which Genesis opens. We are in a Jehovah-created universe, a universe that was created for us, for humans, by God's will. We are the crowning achievements of that creation. And what are we? Well, we are the creatures that were made, in the words of Genesis, B'Tselem Elohim, Hebrew for in the image of God. And so we hold a spark of sanctity within us and are indeed different from all the rest of God's creation. And how shall we live? So as to be pleasing in the sight of the Lord, having been brought into existence by God's will, we must, by rights, live in accordance with God's will. Now, how one goes about the latter commandment to live in accordance with what God wants from us, what specifically the creator of the universe really demands of us, varies significantly among the three Abrahamic religions, and those differences of opinion get quite heated, as we all know. Philosophy, in contrast, isn't defined in terms of any of the answers it gives, as you'll no doubt notice over the course of the coming chapters. Problems will be considered, for example, the problem of free will, what we call the hard problem of consciousness, the problem of personal identity. And for all of these problems, philosophers, different philosophers will reach very different conclusions on the basis of their philosophical reasoning. Philosophy, unlike religion, is not defined by its answers, but by the way that it pursues its questions, utilizing only the tools of reason, conceptual analysis, examination of logical implications, etc. So long as this is how you go about trying, in the widest sense possible, to get your bearings, subjecting all, even conclusions you'd previously reached, to the standards of self-critical reason, then no matter the answers you are provisionally reaching, keeping always an open mind, you are pursuing philosophy. But can't philosophers hold religious beliefs? Of course they can. And some philosophers, in fact, some extremely important philosophers, such as Rene Descartes in the 17th century and Immanuel Kant in the 18th century, were in fact religious in their conclusions. But their religious conclusions were argued for using the general tools of philosophy. If the conclusions that are reached aren't always naturalist, as they weren't in the case of Descartes and Kant, the means of establishing the conclusions are insistently naturalist. No appeals to one high, to revelations, to holy scripture are permissible. And for this reason, even quite religious philosophers, religious in their conclusions, including Descartes and Kant, were often condemned by religious authorities because their techniques exposed religious answers to the possibility of being rejected. So for example, both Descartes and Kant were listed 
in the Vatican's index of prohibited writings. And both remained there until 1966, until the index was finally, permanently abolished. The presence there signals quite clearly the strong demarcation between the approaches of religion on the one hand and philosophy on the other to the great existential questions that were brought to the fore during the Axial Age.